actually. They were like, what do you think? Do we, could we do something virtual? And so we did, we managed to do something virtual and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. But anyways, I happened to be out for a run in the park and I ran into Maggie, almost literally, and um, said, oh, hey, I'm doing this virtual tree walk for the Friends of Monument Valley Park. Do you think it's something, you know, I could share at a local chapter meeting? And, and she's like, yes, this would be good. And we didn't really pull it together until like the end of the year. So uh, <laughs> this is not when you'd normally be taking a tree walk in the park, but the power of photographs is marvelous. But the other interesting thing in doing this this way is that um, we'll see how many people we actually really get, but we've had 58 people register for this talk and I was going through and just looking at where everybody is from and most of you are not from the Colorado Springs area and I know you might not be that familiar with this park so it changed what I decided I was going to do with this presentation I'll be giving you a little bit more history and background but just for fun um, 28 different cities <laughs> were represented in the registration um, three different states. And honestly, somebody registered from France. If you actually turned up, and I'm not sure if you had, it is like the middle of the night there. So I'd be very impressed. And a quick shout out to Dan Benson, because I saw he did show up. You're my favorite person because you were the first person to register. So <laughs> you, made it, you made it real. So um, on we go, let's see. Just to give you a little bit of background on Monument Valley Park, for those of you who haven't uh, ever been to the park and you don't really know the city that well, I know I do have a few veterans of my plant walks in the audience, so welcome to all of you. But Monument Valley Park is, is kind of an interesting park. It's a long urban park. Uh, it's about two miles long along Monument Creek and it is kind of roped in on one side by I-25 um, and a bunch of other little things on that side. Then on the, on the east side, there's quite a bit of residential um, housing that comes up to the park on the north side and Colorado College on the south side. So this map that I know you can't read really um, is just to give you an idea of the shape of the park. And this is really only what I would call the northern part of the park, which is just over half of it. Um, for those of you who do know the city on the left, uh, you can see there's a street that kind of goes across the creek and that's Uinta Street. So we're looking at everything north of that. Um, the whole southern portion is gone, but that's okay because that's the part we're gonna be looking at. And just to give you an idea, the, the creek itself is sort of the silvery gray that you can see going up the middle. And any area that's kind of a bright green is an irrigated area. So it's either picnics or playing fields. A lot of them are playing fields. And then things that are kind of the olive color are labeled as either native area, and I think in some places they're called natural area. A lot of them are called native area. And it, what's interesting is just that this map actually came from a 2005 master plan for the park. And this is part of, um, so there are things in here that didn't actually happen, but they did intend for these areas to stay native or natural and to not be maintained, irrigated, mowed, um, or anything quite like that. Of course, a few years after this, we had an economic downturn. The parks department took a really big hit. So some of the new things they wanted to bring in are still in the works and not happening. And a lot of things have moved to being contracted. So it's been an interesting time. The park itself was a, a gift from General Palmer, the founder of our city back in 1907. And now's a good time to mention that this year we are celebrating, Colorado Springs is celebrating its sequicentennial, its 150th anniversary. Um, and General Palmer is regarded as the, the founder of our city. And he gave a huge gift to the city in, in the form of, of a lot of parks, but uh, many people, including me, consider Monument Valley Park to be one of his greatest gifts to the city. And he was a super well-educated man, very interested in a lot of different areas. He knew his plants. <laughs> um, he knew a lot of things and a lot of planning, thought, time went into this park. So originally it had marvelous gardens, different walks, waterfalls, bridges. There were lakes, people ice skated. It's so fun to see some of the old pictures. And he made sure to include a specimen of every native tree and shrub native to, you know, to Colorado. And there was also the Colorado wild garden, which included some of the flowers. It was a specimen. It really was a reason to visit this town. It was uh, considered a premier botanic 
garden, honestly. And things have changed since then. So in 1935, of course, we had the big Memorial Day flood, which other people in Colorado are aware of, especially those of you in Denver, because it affected way more than just Colorado Springs. It would have affected Pueblo and anybody along all of the major creeks. And after that, from the mid thirties to the um, early forties, there was some works progress administration projects to repair the lakes. The creek was significantly widened, which reduced the amount of land in the park. And there were some really nice pieces of stonework that were, were put in at that point. So it's a, a lot of history to this park. I'm jumping really quick. Um, there's so much that's gone on, but the city did propose selling the north end of the park in 1974. Uh, which just gives me pause every time I think about it because it's my favorite part of the park. In the southern portion of the park that we aren't going to look at so much, that is more developed with the playing fields. There's a swimming pool. There are two ponds. The Horticultural Arts Society has its demonstration garden down there. So there's a lot that goes on in that you know, part of the park and there's a lot of use. Um, as we like to say now, there are a lot of different stakeholders, which I don't really like that word, for this park. Um, people with different goals, different uses. Um, we have cross country meets. We have fitness going on. There's a, an active pickleball uh, group that's going, you know, there's just a lot that goes on in this park. But the north part of the park tends to have some of the more, uh, the quieter areas, not that there's not a lot going on there too. But anyways, the city proposed selling that part. That did not happen. And in 2000, the Friends of the Monument Valley Park was formed. And I think most of us know at this point, any big important park, any, any city parks really, in, inevitably seem to need a friends group to help uh, finance projects, to organize cleanups, to get you know, the public into and appreciating the park as you know, parks and recreation department budgets are often the first to be cut, you know, when we have economic downturns and things like that. So to have the support of a consistent friends group is, is really valuable. And this has been a great group. The park was placed on the natural history uh, register in 2007. And then most recently in terms of the history I'll cover is just that the Friends of Monument Valley Park has done all sorts of things, including uh, I saw Gary Conover is here. He's one of the people that leads a bird walk in the spring and they didn't ask him to do a virtual one last year. Um, but we do go out and, and look at birds in May and the plant walks that I do, they host concerts and inevitably whatever dates they pick for those are the days of the big rains. <laughs> and they have, this is really significant, raised uh, grant money, have, have successfully obtained grants and raised funds for repairing the fantastic stonework in the park, which is something that the parks department just would not be able to afford to do at this point. Here's my fancy schmancy map um, that I wrote. <laughs> As you can see, I have not taken a map making class, but once I decided that I was gonna be sharing information about the plants in the park with people, I originally started actually with a blog and I was jogging in the park. I had just finished my native plant master certification. And I started noticing and seeing the plants with new eyes and noticing that there were a lot of native plants in the park. And, and 2009 was an especially really good bloom year. So I was seeing a lot of things and I thought, well, maybe I'll start a blog and each week what I'll do is I'll say, here's what's blooming, have some pictures and some information. But I also wanted people to be able to visit the park and find these plants themselves. Or if they were regular walkers in the park already, if they saw a plant, they might be able to find out more about it. So I labeled um, certain things in the park with my own names for them. And, and this, I think you can see a little better. You can see the wildflower meadow field towards the middle and the bottom. And, and that's where I've seen a lot of, of great plants. The stone drainage ditch, which is near the Fontenero parking lot there, that's an irrigation ditch from the old El Paso Canal irrigation system in the city. There are interesting plants along that. There's the fox den patch, kind of almost in the middle of the screen. We There's a fox den there and, and some years we have foxes, some years we have fox kits. And it happens to be an area where some of the plants that uh, have caught my attention turned up. So it was a good name for that. So I could say, you know, this week, 
at the Fox Den patch, I saw this, this, and this, and, and hoped that people wouldn't be able to find them. So uh, just keep in mind, as we go from this point forward, I will probably mention the wildflower meadow field, probably mention the, the drainage ditch or the irrigation ditch and, uh, and the geologic column, I think, so. And I'm gonna stop here just real quick. Um, I'm not watching the chat at this point. I'm hoping, more usually I'm just hoping my technology works to the end. But if you do end up having questions, feel free to park them in the chat and I'll try and find a way to get to that at the end and have a, a look-see through there. So the plant walks in the park, how did I end up starting doing these? And uh, like I said, there was the amazing 2009 bloom year. It really was something. I, I think we had decent winter moisture, good late spring moisture, and we had a warm late spring. So things really took off. And like I said, caught my attention. So I started the blog. I have a little screenshot there. You can see the Fox Den patch, what I saw there uh, that particular week. Then I got really brave. I'm not a super social extroverted person, but one day in the shower or something, I was thinking, hey, what if I actually got people to meet me down there at the park and we took a little walk together? Uh, we could, you know, we could talk plants then and they could see them in person. And so I sent off an email to the Old North End Neighborhood Association, which is the neighborhood that comes right up to the park on the north side and said, hey, would you mind putting out there that if people want to meet me this Saturday at 10 o'clock at the Fontanero Street parking lot, I'll take them on a, on a wildflower walk. I used wildflower. People like wildflowers. So, <laughs> and they did, they posted it and about 20, 25 people showed up. I was really pleased and we had a lovely walk and uh, that caught the attention of the friends group. And so they actually started asking me after that, if I wouldn't mind doing it um, through them, if they would host it. And I that started the next year, but I'm not exactly sure. It could have been one more year after that. And then they came up with the idea of the tree walk. They, they said, let's have a fall color walk. And I said, all right, we can, you know, we can do a tree walk too. So those are the two walks that I, I kind of do on a regular basis now. A uh, little side story here. Uh, for those of you who've been on the walk with me, you know that I often talk about the mowing incident. So here's my chance to actually share some photos with you about it. In the big picture here, we're seeing that wildflower meadow field, as I called it. And it's just a little snippet of it. Um, and this is in 2009. And you can see there's some evening primrose blooming. And uh, we've got some loco weed. In fact, if you were able to take this and blow it up, you would see a lot more things blooming in there. And I've got close-ups of a couple of the plants there on the right. It was just absolutely gorgeous. This is what got me started. And this is a picture kind of from the, not kind of from, from the south end of it. You can see, you know, part of the challenge of being a wild, a native plant enthusiast in an urban park <laughs> is that we, and in Colorado Springs, we do not have any naturalists on our parks and rec staff. I, I believe that's still true. Um, we have a lot of sports field management specialists. We have turf grass specialists and they're really into mowing. <laughs> so they were already mowing, you know, an edge along this wildflower meadow field because the 10 foot wide path was, was not enough, you know, all these wildflowers encroaching on it. But anyways, yeah, if we could look in here, you'd see there are tons and tons of things blooming in here. And so I took everybody on the wildflower walk, I was flying high. <laughs> and then about a week later, I went for a run and this is what it looked like. And um, every time I still look at it now, it still, it still just makes my heart kind of stop a little bit. <laughs> who, who could just go in and mow all of this down? So this is how Carrie became uh, known to the Colorado Springs Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, a friend of mine said, hey, you know, if you're that upset about it, maybe here, here's the person to contact. So I wrote a, a very polite email. And, um, and I let them know, like, you know, in the map from the master plan, this was designated a native area. This is not to be mowed, this is not to be maintained, it's certainly not irrigated, it's not a playing field, there is no reason to be mowing this. And I got a very, very nice response um, and an apology and some explanation of why this may have happened. But the kind of neat thing was that at this point, we still had a person who was in charge specifically of the maintenance of this park. And he was really excited to come meet with me um, and ask me about some other areas and uh, to do a little bit of plant ID and um, just, you know, kind of made himself a resource and, 
and definitely promised they, they would not be mowing this from this point on, although they've asked me to, you know, could you remind us every spring? But sadly, since then, I mean, that was 2009, so we were just starting, you know, toward the, the really big economic downturn, and, and Parks and Rec had their budget reduced um, as much as it ever, ever had been. Um, we, in fact, for a little while, there just was no maintenance in the park. They turned off the sprinklers. They didn't pick up trash. Um, the person maintaining this park, that position went away. And, uh, and from that point on till now, almost all the maintenance in the park happens under contract. So it's really hard because there's not a lot of, there's no consistency within the department. Um, you know, there's not one person who follows this park and knows what's going on and, and knows what's happened in the past. So it's up to us um, to be paying attention if it's important to us. So um, from this point on, the plant walks, the way they happen is there's a, a wildflower walk first Saturday in June, tree walk first Saturday in October. That's just what it is now. It's always on the calendar. Last year's walks we had to do virtually, which was interesting. And for the wildflower walk, I would just, for three weeks, I sent in pictures of what was blooming that week, kind of like my blog, said where it was blooming. I, I gave them that map, my fancy map that I drew, and, um, and a little bit of information about the plants. And that worked out fairly well. They posted it out on their Facebook page. I'm not a Facebooker, um, so I, you know, I've, Part of what drives me nuts about Facebook is, uh, you know, you read something and then you come back and it's not where you thought it was. It can't be placed in, in chronological order, <laughs> um, you know, so, but it, you know, they, it seemed to work for them and they were happy about it. The tree walk was a little more interesting because, you know, the trees are there all the time. It's not something blooming each week. So I decided I wanted to do something different and I would post to them, I think one or two videos each week, sort of introducing a section of the, tree walk and then some photos of the trees we would have seen there and some information about them. And that was just a lot harder uh, for them to get out there and organize and for it to make a lot of sense. But I thought before we go through our big botanical tour, because I know that's what Maggie called this, if I promise we are going to look at plants, I would share with you what a couple of those videos look like just in case you're curious. Let's see. <laughs> So I'm not sure if you're actually able to hear the audio. I know sometimes when you screen share, the audio doesn't happen. Um, but what was kind of fun was that my, my husband was my videographer and he would walk, I didn't realize at first he was doing this. He was videotaping me as I walked from one point to the next. Um, and then I would do an introduction of that particular area. So this just gives you a good feel of what this park looks like. <laughs> this is a long stretch of stopping to look at the willow some point along here, I think I stopped to smell the, the bark of a ponderosa. <laughs> so, for those of you who've never been in the park, you just have a speed tour. Um, but you can see there's a lot of trees. And uh, for those of you who normally come on the walk there, it just feels like we got to do it this year. Um, so just a quick list. Um, I just decided I wanted to give you an idea of just the botanical diversity in this portion of the park. So these are the trees that we normally end up looking at and divided into natives and non-natives. Some of the non-natives and a lot of the natives actually have been planted. This park originally, way, way, way back when um, there was a, a park called Willow Park. And the description that I've seen of it said that it was populated mostly by narrow leaf cottonwoods and various willows, probably along the, the creek. So a lot of these natives had to be planted and General Palmer liked to plant trees. And so he did. Um, also planted some non-natives and some of the non-natives 
planted themselves. I'm pretty sure nobody ever planted a Siberian elm if they could avoid it. But uh, you may notice the Japanese tree lilac, the very last tree on the list. General Palmer loved lilacs, and I'm pretty sure that's how the Japanese tree lilac came to be in the park. And there are quite a few of them. We'll see some pictures here in just a few minutes. Um, but things, of course, yes, the silver maple, the Siberian elm, not so much. The Kentucky coffee tree that I know of has been planted probably in the last 20 years. So they, you know, trying to plant some trees that will um, tolerate our, our dry uh, weather, our dry climate and still provide, you know, being that this is an urban park, not an open space, not a national, you know, not forest, not a state park, there is room for introduced trees. And so they've picked, a, you know, some interesting ones. The hackberry is one that's getting planted a lot. And that one's always fun um, because it almost always has the nipple gall and that's always a crowd thriller when we're on a, on a tree tour. Other plants, I was gonna say, you know, perennials or perennials and annuals, but there are some shrubs in here as well. And um, once again, not expecting anybody to remember all of these plants, but you just get a sense that there are, there's a huge variety of plants and they, they bloom from spring to, to very late summer. And this slide probably took me the longest of all the slides to pull together um, because I did want to provide the botanical, the scientific names uh, because common names are so bizarre, uh, even more so. <laughs> I'm surprised as, um, you know, I'm using Ackerfield now for my, my flora and some of her common names are ones I've never heard of and using iNaturalist, um, always be a surprise what the common name might be for something that I've known as something else. So, uh, and of course, some of those have been changing. So it was a little bit of uh, looking through my notes, updating the information I had. And the order, I apologize, I know it's not an alphabetical order by either common or botanical, but it's kind of in the order of how I notice uh, blooming. So the sand lily being one of the very earliest things that I noticed blooming. And, um, and then somehow the grasses ended up at the end. And we will see uh, photos of these when we go through our little tour here very, very soon, I promise. Some non-natives that we often will see on our plant walks, including uh, the nanking cherry. That is probably the very first thing, the very first uh, visible flower that I will notice in the park. And I keep track of this. I started keeping track of, of when I see these things blooming from year to year. I don't blog them anymore because yeah, after a while it felt a little silly just posting the same things every year. But for my own information, I'm really curious to see. And sometimes I've seen the Nanking cherry blooming in um, mid-March and other times it's been a month or so later. So uh, it's interesting how much weather, snow, uh, things like that affect it. Uh, some things in here have probably come in from people's gardens, like I'm guessing the honeysuckle. The birds have probably moved some things along. I'm sure there are a lot of other non-native plants. I'll, I'll probably think of them in the middle of the night when I wake up tonight, but uh, these are the ones that we might point out uh, to people as we go uh, about our tours. Just notice the lilac uh, there in the first column, the lilacs. Once again, I mentioned that General Palmer was a huge lilac fan and he really was. We'll see some beautiful pictures of lilacs. Last year was a good lilac season. And he liked them enough that he would open the park to cars one day a year for lilac day because he wanted everybody regardless of whether they were able to walk, um, you know, or, or their age or whatever, to be able to come in and enjoy the lilacs in the park. And can't get out without talking about the noxious weeds. We do have our share of noxious weeds in Monument Valley Park. And um, from the purple loose strife on list A, down to all the things on, on list C, of course, bindweed. Bindweed is everywhere. Um, the creek itself is technically not part or under the jurisdiction of, of the park, but it is right in the middle of the park and it is such a part of the park that I consider it, you know, I considered it enough of the park to, to put the loose strife in here. The creek, you know, especially once they widened it, it's interesting because you don't really, if you visit the park, you're not gonna go walking right along the edge of the creek. You're gonna be way up high above the creek. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I'm 
I'm in the park probably twice to, to four, two to four times a week, but I do, I jog uh, a couple mornings and one morning jogging along just out of the corner of my eye down by the creek, I see this flash of, of hot pink and I uh, thought, hmm, well, that's interesting. So I took myself under the pedestrian bridge and went down to the creek and sure enough, it was purple loose drive. Another interesting thing about Colorado Springs is we do not have anybody, any office that is really in charge of dealing with uh, noxious weeds. And so it was really hard to find out who I should let know about this so that they could take care of it. And we, we do have this app that you can use to report things like graffiti, weeds growing too high, all kinds of things like that. So I would report it that way. And this is, I've seen it three times now, I think first in 2013, then 15, uh, and then it might've been 18. I was wondering if I was gonna see it every odd numbered year, but, uh, and two of those three times, I eventually went down and cut the flowers off and treated as much of the plant as I could by painting an herbicide on it. I, I didn't wanna spray, I don't have a pesticide applicator's license. I was near water, um, but I felt like we have this one, you know, this one clump of this plant, we have a chance to, to get it out of there. Um, so I was gonna do something about it, so I did. And um, another plant that others, uh, Dalmatian toad flax, there's a little tiny patch of that that I get down there and dig out each year. Cause, and I let them know, I let Parks know I would do that. And of course they were okay with that. Uh, I, the Scotch thistle, I just thought I'd show you, we've, we've, you know, thistles are so pretty and thistles really catch people's attention. Um, most people think all thistles are noxious weeds or are weeds. And of course we have some lovely native thistles. But my friend in the photo here said, I think there was a bunch of Canada thistle in the park. And she took me down there and I was like, oh, this, is, this isn't Canada thistle, this is, this is a different one. And once I got it identified, I said, you know, if this is a biennial, if we can get the flower heads off of this, we can at least help stop the spread of it. So she let Parks know we were gonna do it. Of course they were okay with it. And we spent a very fun couple of hours in the park <laughs> um, dealing with some very, very spiny plants. It was pretty hard. She's not a short person. So you can see this plant is, you know, six to seven feet tall. They were very big that year. Um, so that's another way you could get involved with your, your city parks if you notice some noxious weeds. And, uh, and you know, their list A or B, it's worth, it's worth sharing. I have made sure to let the state noxious weed people know about the loose strife and the county. We live in El Paso County, but El Paso County's noxious weed office only really deals with stuff in unincorporated El Paso County, not within the city. So it's a little frustrating, but you do what you can. And the rest, okay, they're not plants. And I know it's a botanical tour, but people get thrilled when we see animals when we're on our, our plant walks, or just if you're in the park in general. This is not a huge park. It's very skinny. Um, it's not a super great wildlife haven, but I want us to, you know, hang on to what we do have. And back in 2001, some of us might remember we had the moose, the moose turned up in the park and he was a celebrity. I believe I've heard we've had moose since then, but they've tried to keep it a lot quieter <laughs> because people did turn out in crowds. They were worried, you know, that something was going to happen. And, you know, if they'd had to put that moose down, it would have been it would have been awful. Fortunately, after about four months of hanging out, he made his way peacefully out of the park, went north, went up through the Air Force Academy and hopefully found himself a mate and had a happy life. <laughs> but it was really fun at this point. You know, I didn't have a digital camera yet, I don't think. And uh, so it was hard to get so many pictures. Now, of course, I always have my phone on me, but I would be out jogging in the morning. I'd come around the corner and there he'd be. I'd have him all to myself, um, thrilling to say the least. But um, yes, we have owls that are often around when we're doing our plant walk and that's always fun. We, we can stop and, and visit with them. We've got lots of pollinators. And there's my very brave picture of the snake I took last year. I was able to zoom way in on it when I put it on iNaturalist and people identified it for me. So that was pretty cool. Of course, if you have owls, you have owlets that year. Oh, people were over the moon about the owlets when we went on our plant walk. We spent a good long time in that group of, of cottonwoods just watching the owls. And in the ponds, we've had beavers. And of course, I mentioned the fox den, and, and that is one of the residents of the fox den. So before we jump off into the, um, the photo tour, I just wanted to 
mentioned, because this way I can just leave the, the presentation behind before I move into my photo app. Part of why I wanted to do this presentation was just to get you thinking about how and why you might get active in your city parks. I know as native plant people, we go on our hikes, we tend to go out to the, to the open spaces, to the state parks, um, not to our urban parks, at least not here in Colorado Springs. And I think it's really important for people to uh, be connected, feel connected to these assets that we have, especially if you have a park like this that has some uh, natural and native areas uh, that can provide some food for pollinators, can provide some habitat for wildlife. Um, you know, it's important. So if you have nearby neighborhood associations, that's how I did my first tour. If you have a friends group, you, you might approach them about doing a walk with them. I've had local gardening groups ask me to do walks with them, so I've done that. Uh, if doing walks isn't your kind of thing, go ahead, get active on iNaturalist if you're not yet. Maggie kind of gave me the nudge on this. She probably doesn't even know that. But last year, my husband and I headed out for the, uh, what was it, the City Nature Challenge in April, which was when people get out and, you know, basically just find all the nature in their city and post it up to iNaturalist. And it's kind of a, kind of a competition, but not really. Uh, but I made sure everything that I posted on iNaturalist for Monument Valley Park, I put that in the notes because someday that may be important um, to someone to know that that particular plant was, was growing in the park. Um, keeping records from year to year, uh, basically encouraging some citizen science, uh, like we were talking about at the beginning of tonight, take photos, maybe do a blog, who knows, but you know, just something that's near you and um, has some interesting things going in it, you can share it with the people in, you know, nearby. And people really love coming on these walks. There are people who've lived in the neighborhood for decades, who didn't know what was growing there. There are people who can't get out um, to spaces farther away than this park. It's very accessible. Uh, they are really appreciative of having something like a nature walk that they can come and attend. People really are grateful when you offer it out. And when I'm out there digging up the Dalmatian toad flags, uh, nothing gets people coming up and saying hello to you than heading into your park with a shovel or <laughs> a shovel in a bucket or, um, you know, some pruners or something. And, and I get to talk to people that way too. So there's lots of ways you can share what's going on in your, in your parks. Let's see now if I can remember how to switch to our photo tour. Carrie? Yes. There are some lingering questions from the first section of your talk. Oh, okay. Let's do that. That did you mind feeding them to me? Not at all. Um, the Great, first thanks. one was, did the mode flower area recover? Okay, yes, we revisit it every year. Um, What's interesting about the mowing is that, of course, things like dandelion, the taprooted things, uh, the weeds like that, do a marvelous job of coming back. It took some other things a little while longer. Um, but I guess part of the upside of a low park and rec budget is that um, so there were some years that nothing happened in there. So there's a, you know, a lot of the plants made it, made it back. But we also don't have any weed control efforts in the park either. So it makes it sometimes kind of a tough sell to say, hey, this is this wonderful, you know, wildflower meadow field when there's a lot of um, other weeds in there as well. But yes, it did recover. Okay, another question. Have you noticed hairy willow herb? It's popping up all over the place in wetter areas in Boulder. I have not noticed that one yet. I do, I am familiar with that because um, I took a native plant class up in Denver uh, at the South Platte, South Platte Park, is that the name of it? I can't think. Um, and we actually, we saw it. Uh, that summer, but I haven't. I'm keeping my eyes open because yes, I have. I have heard that it is uh, it is proliferating. Okay, um, South Platte Park. Just for the re reference, I used to live right there. I 
Yale oh, okay. and Sherman when I was in grad school. Um, cool. Okay, does the scotch thistle still die if you remove the flowers? And I responded already by saying deadheading reduces the seed bank. It does not kill the plant. If you sever the plant at the ground level, you can slow it down by reducing the photosynthetic capacity. But it wow. is perennial and you may not want to dig up thistles because severed roots make new plants, especially with Canada thistle. Choosing landscapes, uh, choosing, oh, that was another comment. Oh, okay. Well, actually at that um, point, yes, I know, we actually do have Canada thistle in the park and I know what you're talking about there because um, yeah, it's tenacious. There's, you know, there's not much you can do with that. These scotch thistle that we had, and I did do some research ahead and I did do some questions and it was my understanding that they were biennial. Uh, they so the are idea biennial. Was Someone already yes. corrected me in this oh, okay, good. In the chat. Okay. My apologies. Well, I could believe that. I mean, honestly, I could believe they would evolve, but uh, fortunately, they're really pretty, but they're very easy to identify. So, yeah, cutting down those six foot plants, that was, and I, we had to remove them too, because a lot of plants, you cut those flowers and they'll go to seed, you know, really quick. So, it was a project. Okay, I think that's all the questions, so you can okay. go on. I'm so glad to hear from you because this is so weird. <laughs> like, I can't see people. I, I told my husband, I'm like, I kind of need, you know, they have the little applause thing and, and there's stuff, I think that's in the chat and I'm not even watching that. So it's like, I hope people still hear me. I said, they kind of need a little snoring thing. So I know if people are nodding off, but okay, no. great, so you're all. Still with Dan, me. Dan is giving you a thumbs up. Okay, and great. And <laughs> I only turned my video off because I had to go make some food <laughs> for my well, children. That's okay. No, and I'm <laughs> actually trying to give myself the full screen so I can see everything that's here. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, so, as promised, now I have a an actual true what, what we'll call the botanical tour, um, and I'll try not to talk too much about each of these slides. But this is. Um, this is probably what most of you have come for. Uh, as I mentioned, General Palmer was into everything. And so he actually had some greenhouses built in the park and back in 1907. And I actually got to work in this greenhouse one, one particular uh, spring when I was in the Horticultural Arts Society board. I volunteered to start some of our All-American Selection seeds in the, in the General Palmer greenhouse. Now, this was after it had been closed for a few years because of budget. And I did not know we had a thriving population of mice. So I would, I would sow all these seeds. They would come up a tiny bit and I would come back the next day and they'd be gone. And I could not figure out what was going on until I finally saw some sign of mice on the, on the actual plant tray. So that was kind of, kind of fun. Um, but anyways, these are still there. They're still in use and the city has additional greenhouses um, that they've used in the past to grow plants for like the medians and the streets and things like that. But I just love that we have his greenhouse. What a man. So this is where I enter the park. This is what we call the Columbia Street entrance. And this is some of that WPA stonework that I was mentioning before. And in fact, this was the latest uh, stonework to be Actually, that's not quite right. It was last year. There was, a, there was a lot of repair work on this. This year, they did repair what they call the floor of it, which is covered by snow here. Um, they didn't realize that the stones were supposed to be visible in the floor when they did the previous work on it. So they had them come back as part of an additional grant. And they worked on the floor this year, in addition to the geologic column, which we'll see momentarily. Here's a little more stonework from up on the east side of the park, looking out at some of the trees that uh, populate in the park. So we've got some of the, the junipers and some ponderosa pine. And you can see I took this just a few weeks ago. So it's, it's winter and the cottonwood in the background doesn't have any leaves. Uh, but they worked on, on this stonework this year as well, but there are a lot. This is one of my favorite places to go in the park. Uh, an interesting thing about this park is that it is so close to the highway, to the interstate. And at some point, a lot of vegetation was removed to widen the interstate. And so the interstate is a, always a presence in this park. You always hear it. And sometimes, so I can come to this part here and, I, and I'm actually able to tune it out and you're surrounded by trees. Um, and there's always you know, interesting wildlife going around. It's just a lovely place to sit for a few moments and enjoy. 
a little bit more of the beautiful stonework. And this is the geologic column. And um, in the previous picture here, you can see this little bridge. In this picture, if you look up, you can see the bridge above the far end of the geologic column. Right under that bridge is where a waterfall would come. And uh, that was the from that irrigation ditch that I had the picture of before. And so this was all part of the El Paso Canal system. And it filled a little pond down here below the, the column. And that hasn't been around for a while. So if you're interested in geology at all, it is worth coming to see this. This was part of the original 1907 park um, from General Palmer. There's an explanatory sign that finally went up. <laughs> it's been years since the friends have been able to get that sign put in. There used to be a big sign mounted to those uh, strata of, of rock before, but that, you know, there was such theft happening of anything that was brass or bronze or whatever in the parks that um, I, I think this one wasn't stolen. They took it down to save. I can't remember. There were signs that, that were stolen. Um, but I think each of these layers is supposed to represent the strata of rock that we have, um, I think, on you pass. Uh, but anyways, uh, a really a geologic treasure. So this was the big grant work um, project that was done this year. Standing here looking up, you can see some of the uh, beautiful pinion pines that we have. The pinion pines, which are right at the Fontenero Street entrance. You all remember that map, right? Um, are some of the tallest, biggest pinion pines I've ever seen. And we are at kind of the north end of the native range for this tree. Now, being in an urban park <laughs> and needing to have some maintenance done, um, this is the kind of thing that happens to your native trees. And they limb them way up. Uh, this always looks to me like the ladies lifting their skirts or something like that. But they did this so that the workers could move in and out easily. Um, and you know, not be getting injured, and not be damaging the trees. So um, yeah, part of the fun of, of an urban park. This was before they did the trimming. This is actually the same spot. This is almost where we always start the tree walk, you know, because the parking lot's right there. So we start off by looking at these pinion pines. And you can see, you know, the irrigation ditch is right here in front of us. And if you follow it to the end, there are a bunch of leaves at the bottom of that pinion that are not pinion trees. So birds hang out in that tree and plant all kinds of other trees. And I think all this has been removed because the work happened after this, but there was a mulberry tree under there. Uh, there was an American elm. I'm sure there was probably some Virginia creeper. So we would stop and we would look in the tree tour. We look at the, the white mulberry because uh, it has the distinction of its pollen when it's released is like the fastest motion in the natural world. It's, it's faster than the speed of sound, <laughs> which is just amazing to me. So I kind of hope this goes back because it's, you know, it's a, it's a crowd thriller. We have ponderosa pine all over the park. So this was one, I think I took this picture. It's actually up on the uh, running path above the creek because they started limbing these up as well. <laughs> so this one's lost its bottom branches. Look at that sky, that Colorado sky. The first native plant that I see blooming in the park is the American plum. So I take a picture pretty much every year. I discovered today as I went through all my photos. And uh, if we're lucky, it doesn't get frozen and we actually get some, some plums on these little plants. Here's, uh, I think, another picture. Yeah, it's kind of a, now you can sort of see the grove of plums growing up behind the other trees. The American box elder. This box elder doesn't get a lot of respect, but it's native to Colorado. So we stop and we take a look at it. This is along the edge of what we call Boddington playing field, which is a sunken playing field. And the reason it's sunken is because it used to be a reservoir, once again, for that El Paso canal irrigation system. So it's made a really good playing field because it's hard to kick the ball out on the street when it's sunken down so low. But along the edge of Boddington Field, is really um, interesting. I'm not sure how these plants all came to be here. A lot of them have to have been um, squirrel and bird planted because we have a thicket of, we have Siberian elm, we have the box elder, we have a lot of green ash. There is choke cherry, um, sure I'm forgetting something, but, uh, but you can get up close and personal to them, which is nice, especially if you catch a year, um, you know, that we happen to have the walk when they're, when they're blooming, when the box elder is, is blooming. Sometimes they ash too. Cottonwoods are a big presence in the park. 
a lot of my cottonwood pictures are even just from this past year. So I just have some kind of nice overviews. Sometimes I just can't help myself and I got to stop and take pictures of them. This is cool, Pie. Oh, good. And this one here, I think, is, I think that bright, bright tree back there is quite possibly a green ash. Sometimes the green ashes are the prettiest autumn color <laughs> in our park. There's another cottonwood. I'm always looking for reasons to stop when I jog. I'm not one of those people who is addicted to jogging and loves to jog. What gets me down and jogging is this park and seeing what's going on and uh, seeing what the season's like. So uh, one of the major parts of the, of the tree walk that I like to do with people is to share with them that we have three kinds of cottonwood in the park. And that's usually um, surprise information to them that there's more than one kind of cottonwood. Like we have three native cottonwoods and we have them all in this park and we have them all within a, a small area. Actually, they're really close to each other. So it's nice, we can actually compare the leaves and, um, share the and they're on different levels. You, but somebody's unmuted and if you would go ahead everybody would just check your muted i'd appreciate it um so anyways there are many different ground levels in the park so sometimes you can come along and see a branch of a tree that's growing down lower but but you can get up close to the leaves because you're up higher than it and this is one of those cases so we can look at the plains cottonwood leaf and then i show them the ever beautiful narrow leaf cottonwood which always they kind of look pretty scraggly most of the time um, and as I mentioned earlier, they're one of the original occupants of this park, the, the narrow leaf cottonwood. I don't have a close up of the leaf here. I know most of you know what they look like. But what we use this for in the walk is, is to say, because yeah, a lot of people say, well, gosh, that looks like a willow. And you know, how do I tell this apart from a willow? So we, we get to get into that as well. I show them because we're it's October. It usually has its leaf buds. And so everybody's always so excited, like, hey, look here, these are next year's leaves. They're already here. And because they're dark and pointy, it means it's a cottonwood and not a willow. This is one of my absolute favorite trees in the park. In fact, I would say it's my favorite tree in the park. It is actually multi-trunked and you can kind of see that here. You know, there's a group of three there and uh, one off to the right. So it's not considered a single tree, but to me, when I see that, it's got the form of one. And this is a lance leaf cottonwood and it's at the very north end of that playing field. Usually on the walk, we're about to make a U-turn and start heading back south when we see this, but I think I have, yeah, close up of its leaf too. So I like to share the three leaves and show that this is a naturally occurring hybrid between the other two natives, between the narrow leaf and the plains. And when you look at the narrow leaf leaf and the plains leaf, you can kind of see if those two plants got together, this is what their baby's leaf should look like. You know, It's not quite as triangular, but still has that almost deltoid shape and it's a little bit longer. Um, and some of our biggest cottonwoods in the park are the, yeah, the hybrid, are the lance leaf. And I believe that General Palmer had a lot of these planted. And the last time I did an in-person walk, which was 2019, I started looking into the lifespans of these trees. And we are reaching kind of the end of the lifespan for a lot of these trees. And some of them are failing. You know, I had wondered, is it drought? You know, they have to have direct access to water with their roots. Um, this is a riparian corridor. It's fairly moist. Um, so I think they're getting decent amounts of water, but I think some of them are just getting to the end of their lifespan. And some cottonwoods in the south part of the park were recently cut down um, because they were becoming and considered a hazard to the, to the walkers and the uh, users of the park. It's always, it's always so uh, striking to see an old resident of the park like this and they come back and it's a, a stump and so you definitely notice it's missing. But they put on a good color show this last year. So I took quite a few photos. Oh, this one's kind of an overlook. We're up a little bit higher along the edge of the sunken playing field. We're not even looking at the sunken playing field. It's behind us, but in front of us is also sunken. Um, so we're up a little bit higher in the trees. On the right corner though, you can see there's a, a pinion pine. At some point there was a line of pinion pines planted along the path up here. I'm not exactly sure why, but you get a real appreciation for what slow growers they are because they've been there as long as I have been running in the park and that's a couple decades now. 
um, and they aren't a whole lot bigger. What's nice about these as we do our walk is there's a couple that will often um, have a few cones for us that we can take a look at and see the little pinion nuts in it. And uh, that's always kind of a fun find. Oh, i take a drink of water here. This is one of my favorite views on my walks and jogs. I feel like I'm so lucky that uh, this is where I get to go. It's so pretty. This is the north end of Bonington Field, mostly the cottonwoods. One of the things I like about the cottonwoods is they are pretty much, I'd say, the first thing to bloom in the park. Um, like starting next month, I might start to get notifications of <laughs> the cottonwood pollen. Um, and then eventually, of course, we get the catkins and stuff. And when you can catch them, it, they're, they're awfully pretty. The Douglas fir. Um, Douglas firs are becoming fewer and far between in the park, and I'm not exactly sure why. I don't know that I can blame drought. I've seen them growing in far drier places, like over in Red Rock Canyon open space. Um, so I'm actually running out of, of Douglas firs that I can show people, which is kind of sad because people love to see. I like to show them the cone, um, you know, that always looks like that there's a little mouse trying to hide under the scales. And that's, and I'm right, that's how you remember the Douglas fir because the little mouse is named Doug. So um, yeah, I don't think I'll get to make that joke too many more times because this is mostly what we're seeing of the Douglas firs now is they're dying and, um, and being cut down. So. I put this in here for my blue spruce picture. I'm not really sure why, it's just we lose them too. This is actually in the Horticultural Arts Society's demonstration garden. But the, the blue spruces, the Colorado spruces are fairly narrow, uh, not narrow, shallow rooted. And especially if they're in areas that are not irrigated in the park. I mean, they're native to Colorado, but they're not native to super dry parts of Colorado. They tend to, to need more moisture. Um, and so just even in town, you know, after a good windstorm, we often will see um, this with our, with our spruces. The, the white firs that we have are just gorgeous and mostly they are planted in irrigated areas and I think that that's partly uh, why they succeed so well. Part of what had, I enjoyed about the Douglas firs, the Colorado spruces and the white firs is that they look so similar from far away and when you have a group out, you know, uh, we'd be across the field and I'd say, ah, what do you think that is? And everybody would say that that's a Colorado blue spruce and so then we could go up and look at it a little closer and learn a little bit of tree ID. Sometimes we do lose pieces of the firs and this piece happened to be down. So I, I got a picture of this because the cones are always up at the top and then they break apart before they come down. So you rarely get to see the white fir cones. So whenever I get a chance, I take, I take a picture of them. And I try and get people to come up and, and when I say shake hands with the fur, and that's what I'm doing here, you can see that, uh, you know, because they're friendly, the leaves are, you know, the needles are flat, friendly, it's a fur. Uh, you know, if you shake hands with a spruce, um, it, it might draw blood. It's sharp, it's, it's painful. We do have a few limber pines. I think they've been planted in the last 20 years or so. Um, so I decided to get those guys in here. They're not super fast growers, uh, but I enjoy seeing them. We have several kinds of willows. I think we've got peach leaf willow. I'm sure we must have a crack willow somewhere, but being this old park, <laughs> I think we also have a weeping willow. I think that's what that is. I'm not completely sure, but um, you know, and we, I think we all know a weeping willow is not our best tree choice, but uh, they've been let go in this, you know, it's just, it, they kind of have an interesting beauty all their own when they're, when they're gnarly looking like this become the whomping willow. And here's our willow bud. Uh, usually we can get close enough to a willow on the walk to then show the willow bud as opposed to the narrow leaf cottonwood bud. And, and people feel like they've got something they can share at a party next time, how to tell these two trees apart. And I'm taking pictures throughout the year. So I happened to catch some of the willow catkins one year too. The New Mexico locust, I kind of I love this plant. I think it's close enough to be native that I consider it kind of native. It's native in the southern portion of the state. Um, and it has a gorgeous flower. It's a pea family flower and we can get up really close to it so I can show people the pea flowers. And you know, you can play with them and pop them open. And after a while, people start to recognize the pea flowers on other plants that we see when we're out on the walks. They do have tiny thorns. They are not a great landscape plant. So a park is a good place for these because they do run by suckers. And um, unfortunately this year, at some point, uh, somebody parks decided they were gonna be getting rid of some non-native trees that were trouble trees. So they've been cutting down some Siberian elms. I forget 
what the second one was, but then they also said they were cutting down black locust. And on one of my runs, I happened to see uh, two guys out with a front loader and they were basically bulldozing down this line of New Mexico locusts. Um, I, there were just so many things wrong with that. I was like, first of all, a front loader really is that's what we're going to do. I mean, it was such a mess. It just left it such an eyesore. Uh, later on, I read some article about why they were doing this. And they're like, now the natives would naturally take over. Well, there was, I mean, nothing but smooth brome around, you know, the area where they were doing this. There are no natives who were going to swoop in and, and take over. But on the upside, uh, a month later or so, of course, these guys are so tenacious that they, uh, they were all up to about knee high again. Here's a, a bigger picture of them. They do tend to come up between other things. We don't have a lot of, like I said, a lot of weed maintenance, um, a lot of money for taking out overcrowding trees and things like that. So we do have a lot of thickets. But people like this plant. It blooms right after the lilacs. Often they think they are lilacs uh, just because of the color, especially when they see them from far away. And another plant they like is the Japanese tree lilac, which you can see that the locust is still blooming in front here. It's probably just peaking and the tree lag, lilacs are getting going. And we, like I mentioned, have a lot of Japanese tree lilacs in the park. They smell marvelous. They start blooming after the regular, you know, the, the garden lilacs are done. So it, expen it extends our lilac season. And one of my favorite views, like I said, we've got these different levels. So here we are up higher looking down on the sunken area. So you can, you know, we're looking down on these uh, tree lilacs. And in fact, when we go all the way north and then start heading back, we, will, we end up walking right through and under those tree lilacs. So we get to see them a lot closer. They're kind of a crowd pleaser. <laughs> Not something you see in a lot of, a lot of parks. Yeah, all right, moving out of the trees. Like I said, the sand lily is often one of the first things I see blooming. Um, so here's a couple, I'm pretty sure this is that wildflower meadow field. It's a busy place. And the Lambert's local weed, I think that's what this is. It's some years it is just fluorescent hot pink. And in fact, now if you actually you know, can draw your attention away from that, you can see that there's evening primrose blooming. There's a mustard going in the back. I think there's salsify in here. We've got yucca up front. You've got remains of the grass stalks from the previous year. Um, some years I've thought, you know, I could tell them it might not be so bad to mow this meadow in like October, but I'm a little bit afraid to give them encouragement to mow at any point. So um, often the old stuff from the previous year is, is up and visible for, for a while. The pacoon, that's another early one that I see um, both in the meadow and in some other places. And it's, it's pretty darn bright. It's hard to get a good picture of it without it wanting to go out of focus on me. The evening primrose can just be fabulous. Um, I've yet to figure out what really triggers a good bloom year for them. Uh, and we have more than one kind. I know we probably have Anothera cespitosa. I think we have Coronopifolia, um, but I think we have others as well. And um, some years it is just the dominant thing for several weeks. And then we have years like last year, I didn't see a single one uh, blooming in the park. So I was um, kind of mystified by it. It's never the, never the same year twice. This is the irrigation ditch. We're actually looking at the Fontanero Street parking lot. This was a good year. There's uh, quite a bit that foamy white, I believe is the wild onion, which we'll probably take a look at here in a second, growing with uh, some of the spider wart. There's probably two or three other things blooming in there. It's funny, we start here and often we'll just get stuck here for you know, like a half an hour because I'll be like, well, I'm not gonna cover everything here because we're gonna see some of it again later and people won't let me leave. <laughs> Gary, what is this? What is this? What is this? And it's this tiny little little patch. Um, so it's, it's fun. So yep, there's our, our early blooming wild onion and the spider wart, one of my favorites. Just love that color, love that structure. Love those anthers. I believe I'm not a pea expert. I think this is the American vetch. I don't see this very often, but I saw it last year. And so I made sure to, to get a photo of it and get it on iNaturalist. We have more than one kind of penstemon. I think Kurt helped me identify this as the one-sided, the Vergatus. Cowboy's Delight, people love Cowboy's Delight, Sparousia coccinia. Um, it looks like a little hollyhock. And we even got a tiny little native bee in there. It's often blooming when we do the wildflower walk that first weekend in June, but not always. You can't count on it. Depends what the weather has been doing, but I just, I think it's a stunner. The leaves are a cool shape and orange, such an unusual color for the flowers. So uh, got our golden currants, also another early bloomer. They smell good. They bloom in a lot of places throughout the park. 
the Scarlet Gara, which they changed the name of. This is now an Inathra and not a Gara, but I'm still going to call it Scarlet Gara. Um, it was Gara Coccinia. That was so easy to remember. Now it's Inathra, something I can't pronounce, but it's a beautiful little flower. And um, you kind of have to look for it some years, but it's um, often there and it's got that kind of corally pink color. It gets a little darker as it fades. This, I can't believe I got such a good picture of this. This is an Oplintia that grows in that wildflower meadow. And it's, it rarely is this easy to find. It's sort of interspersed among everything. And you have to be careful walking through that field. I've brought home several of these little pads on the bottom of my pants because <laughs> um, they stick pretty easily, but uh, they, they're shaped like little potatoes. And they, um, I think they actually are not all that widespread. So it's kind of unusual to have them there in the really good drainage. So this is that meadow that got mowed, um, but these grow pretty low, at, uh, pretty gutsy mowing down a big field of cacti. But I have been, like I said, been going to that park for uh, you know several, couple decades now, and I've been aware of this plant. And I would never see it blooming, never see it blooming. And then I believe it was 2018 on July 4th, my husband and I went for a bike ride. We were coming back. So I was up a little higher on the bike and I noticed some blooms. So we got off and we took some pictures. I don't know if I've missed it other years just because it's so hidden, um, but yes, it does bloom. Of course, we've got our showy milkweed. I don't know I've ever seen a, a monarch in the park, but I've seen them at my house nearby. And you can see, I mean, we've got the plant up front, but if you pull your eyes up, this, this field goes, it goes back a ways. There are a lot, a lot of these plants here. Um, I like them, I'm glad to see them. We have a Thelosperma that grows, uh, seems happy in dry years. So sometimes this is the dominant plant that we'll see. If there's a little bit of rain, it's even happier. I think I've got, yeah, here's a nice picture of it one year at the irrigation ditch with the spider worth the purples, but all that yellow is that, I believe it's Thelosperma filifolium. Um, and it was all over the park that year. It's a, it's a good plant. Here, you know, an, an interesting thing about this picture is you can see where the maintained side is and the non maintained on the, on the south side of the irrigation ditch, that is mowed, that is irrigated from the north side up um, and beyond is supposed to be where the maintenance stops, where the mowing doesn't happen. I do kind of have to argue with them every year a little bit about that. We do have the woods roads. <laughs> got more Thelosperma in there, but like I said, we do have our share of weeds. We've got the annual lettuce here. Uh, what do we call that? Prickly lettuce. I think there's some salsify, salsify. People kind of like the salsify, especially when it goes to seed and it's like a big old softball. So they like to see that. Getting later in the year now, this is the Senecio spartioides. Uh, I know that we're getting, you know, to late summer when I see this blooming. And the Liatris, I love the Liatris. It's so, it blooms in the back of that meadow field. So I have to kind of bushwhack to get, cactus whack, I guess, to get back through there and be careful. I've collected seed off of this some year to try and I've got it to germinate, but I have a hard time getting it to, to transfer into my, my landscape, unfortunately. And I love to catch the grasses in bloom, especially if it's during the wildflower walk or one of our plant walks. So here's some of the grandma with the, the little dangly flowers hanging off. Non-natives, uh, like I mentioned, well, he's a lilac lover and there's some of the WPA rock work. This was last year. Now the cool thing, like there is no maintenance on these lilacs ever. Any of us who has a lilac in our garden, we know like, oh, we're supposed to deadhead it, but not until, you know, not after July 4th, because then it's next year flowers, nothing, nothing happens to these lilacs and look at them. You know, they just, they just thrive on, uh, on neglect, especially in a good year. And what made this a good year? I really don't know. The Columbia Street rock entrance where I come in, this is from down below, one of the cool things about it is it has these open planting areas, one on each end. Unfortunately, they haven't been kept up at all for, for several decades at this point, but you can get an idea of what was planted in there. And there's a white lilac in there along with a lot of choke cherry. That's what's here. In the very corner closest to us, you might be able to see, we've got a Siberian elm that just hasn't leafed out yet. So one of my annual tasks is I go down there and cut it and brush it with brush be gone and, and then hope it's gone. And then I go back and do it again the next year. The other planting area is on the other, is, is farther down the path and you can't really see it from here. And that one is just filled with, with Canada thistle. I don't know what to, what to do about that. 
But here's some others that are growing. You know, that one was such a nice specimen next to the rockwork. This one's just out there growing with it. That one's got, I think, a choke cherry in front of it. And um, looks like we've got an elm off to the left behind it. This is one of the wild shrubbier areas, but they're still just as happy as they can be. We have goji berry. People know that that's exciting because that's an expensive little thing to buy at the health, health food store, but Lyceum barbarum, also known as wolfberry, matrimony vine. I think it was planted in the park to uh, stabilize the hillsides at some point. And now this is the thing that they keep having to cut back from the edges of the geologic column because they don't want the roots to interfere with the stonework. There's its flower. It's actually related to tomatoes. Um, and you can kind of see that in the, in the form of the flower. Smooth brome was also planted at some point. Um, you know, that was kind of a popular thing to do at some point if you needed to fill an area or stabilize an area. And once you, I mean, be sure you want it when you plant those because once you got it, you got it. But it can certainly be pretty once it gets to the point where it blooms and sometimes it's blooming for our walk too. I think this looks like one I put on Instagram. I must have put a, a filter on it. Gorgeous little yellow flowers. Bouncing bet, moving to the noxious weeds. Uh, one of the first ones that I noticed and got me into studying the noxious weeds a little bit, Saponaria officinalis. Um, and we've got large patches of this. And I think this is an, a, an escaped garden ornamental. I mean, that's what you know, eventually it became on the noxious weed list because it was just too aggressive. And if you wonder if you have it, if you, it looks like a wild phlox, it's not phlox, but take a look at the leaves. And if you've got three prominent veins, you've probably got bouncing bed. If you've got one vein, then you've got phlox. So here's a bigger, a bigger grouping of it. We have had tamarisk pop up. And when tamarisk pops up, I do try and get some attention to it because we don't have very much of it. It's on list B. But um, I still feel like if we just have one specimen, if we can get rid of it. And so I think I've reported it three times. Um, and this time the forestry guys came out and I had to lead them to it. So you can see he's up there getting ready to cut it. And it was funny because the two of them were working on it here. And all of a sudden they jumped back. Apparently there was a snake who was very happily uh, hanging out in the shade underneath, underneath the plant. So there's my, my Dalmatian toad flax. This picture is from 2009. So this is when I started paying attention to keeping records, starting doing plant walks and things like that. And I think after the plant walk, I went to my car, got my shovel and came over, dug it up and took it off with me. And I've been doing it. I've read that if you do it consistently, you can eventually get on top of or get rid of it. Otherwise you need to go with chemicals. And I, you know, I don't have access to the ones they need and I didn't really want to do that. So I have done this every year. This was last year. I don't know that I'm making headway, but it's not getting a whole lot bigger. Um, so I dug that all out after I took the picture. You can see a little bit of spider wart back there and looks like a salsify and a gorgeous tree, tree vista. So lovely vistas in the park. But for now, this is what it looks like if we're lucky and we get some snow. But soon we should, uh, should be back in the blooms. So that's your botanical tour. Let's see if I can stop my share. Thanks for all of you who've hung out with me. Uh, Maggie, do you have any other questions that you, since you've been paying attention? <laughs> 